The War for Mansell by John Bunyan As told by Ethel Barrett Copyright 1998 Christian Light Publications Incorporated Harrisonburg, Virginia Emmanuel's Reception in Mansell The prisoners were coming back. What a day! The townsfolk of Mansell looked from the walls in wonder. The prisoners had gone to the camp in black. They were coming back to town in white. They'd gone in chains and ropes. They were coming back in chains of gold. They'd gone in fetters. They were coming back with confident strides. They'd gone expecting death. They were coming back with assurance of life. They'd gone with heavy hearts. They were coming back with captain faith and with flying colors. The poor and tottering town of Mansell gave such a shout as made the captain and the prince's army leap at the sound. And who could blame them for shouting? For it was as if their dead were back to life again. It was like a resurrection, and the feeling spread through the whole town. When the officers marched in the air gate, they were greeted with, Welcome, welcome, and how did it go? And how will it be with us? And the officers answered, Glad tidings, good tidings of good and of great joy to poor Mansell. It was Mr. Conscience who put it in one word, Pardon. Pardon, pardon, pardon for Mansell, and they shouted until the earth rang. Oh, the joy of pardon. He told them to meet in the marketplace in the morning to hear their general pardon read, and they went on their ways rejoicing. What a change in the countenance of the town. No one could sleep that night for joy. From every home were sounds of singing and making merry and telling and retelling the wondrous tale. And they thought, more of this tomorrow. It was almost too much to contain. So the night passed. <clears throat> what a sunrise, what a morning, what a day. It was the most glorious sunrise Mansell had ever known. The crowd was in the market square early, eagerly waiting when the officers arrived. And the officers were dressed in the same glory the prince had put on them the day before. The whole street was brightened with their glory. Then the recorder beckoned with his hand for silence and read the pardon with a loud voice. But when he came to these words, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and glorious, pardoning iniquity, transgressions, and sins, his voice was drowned in the townsfolk's cheering. They could not help leaping for joy. After the pardon was read, they ran up and down the walls of the town and shouted, Let Emmanuel live forever! Then all the trumpets in Emmanuel's camp were sounded in the distance, and all the colors displayed. The captains showed themselves in all their harness, and the soldiers shouted for joy. Even Captain Faith could not keep out of it, though he was in the castle. He showed himself on top of one of the towers and blew his trumpet. Then the people cleared the center of the market square, and the new army of the prince displayed drills and feats of war. They marched, they countermarched. They opened to the right and the left, they divided and subdivided, they closed, they wheeled, made good their front and rear with their right and left wings, and twenty formations more, and then were all as they were originally. The drills ended in a mighty parade down the main street, trumpets blowing colors high. It continued out of the town and onto the camp of the prince, and the town came nigh and touched the top of his golden scepter, and said, Oh, that Emmanuel would dwell with us forever that his battering rams and slings would be set for the defense of Mansell. For we have room for thee, we have room for thy men, we have room for thy weapons of war. Come, Emmanuel, and thou shalt be king in Mansell forever. Govern us according to the desire of thy soul, and we will become thy servants, and thy laws shall be our directions. And so he came, clad in his golden armor, riding in his golden chariot, and accompanied by his captains and thousands of his soldiers. The streets were strewn with flowers and boughs. The casements, the windows, the balconies, the tops of the houses, and the city walls were filled with persons of all sorts to behold how their town was to be filled with good. There was music everywhere. The officials and the elders of Mansell met him to salute him with a thousand welcomes, and walked ahead of his golden chariot all the way to the castle. Captain Faith came out to meet him and to inform him that the castle was cleaned and ready. 
The cobwebs were gone, the dust bunnies were gone, the dirt was gone, and everything was polished and cleansed and shining. So Captain Faith conducted the prince and his mighty captains and men of war into the castle in the very heart of Mansell. Prince Emmanuel had come home. It was love such as they had never experienced or dreamed of before. No other love had been like it. No other love ever would be again. They thought they never should have enough of Prince Emmanuel. His person, his actions, his words were so pleasing, so desirable to them. It amounted to a craving for his presence. They asked him to walk in the streets and visit the homes often. For, they said, your presence, your looks, your smiles, your words are the life and the strength and the sinews of Mansell. And they wanted continuous and easy access to him in his castle, too. So Emmanuel commanded that the gates should stand open at all times that they might see his doings, as well as the fortifications of the castle and the royal mansion house of the prince. Emmanuel had the attention of the whole town. The people were completely absorbed in him so that when he spoke they shut up their mouths and quelled their wandering thoughts and listened. It was their delight to imitate him. To be with him was to satisfy hunger. To be away from him was to be hungry again. There were special feast days, too. Emmanuel would make a feast for them in his castle and invite them to come and partake of his banquet. And what a spread it was! All manner of luscious food, not food that grew in the fields of Mansoul nor in the whole kingdom of universe. It was food that came from his father's court. Food, dish after strange and wonderful dish, it was set before them, and they were commanded to eat freely. With each new dish, they would whisper among themselves, What is it? What is it? For they did not know what to call it. So Mansoul did eat the food that was peculiar to the court. They ate, and they were filled. And there was music all the while, played by masters of the songs that were sung at the court of Shaddai. But the feasting was not all. Afterward, Emmanuel entertained them with riddles of secrets drawn up by his father's Lord High Secretary, riddles concerning Emmanuel and his father, Shaddai. There were no riddles like them in any kingdom. They saw what they never saw before. They never knew such rarities could be couched in such ordinary words. They discovered that many simple things that had meant nothing to them before were really pictures of King Shaddai himself and his son, Prince Emmanuel, and about their dealings with Mansell. They would consider the riddle, then look on his blessed face and cry, You're the lamb, you're the sacrifice, you're the rock, you're the door, you're the way, and on and on, there seemed to be no end to the treasures. They were again transported with joy. They were drowned in wonderment when they saw and understood the mysteries Emmanuel opened to them. They returned home with gifts, precious jewels, gold chains, and dainties. And when they were home and in their most retired places, they could not help but sing of him. Yes, yeah, so taken were they now with their prince, that they would sing of him in their sleep. There were practical things to do, too. Remodeling, for one. There were practical things to do, too. Remodeling, for one. And that meant building up and tearing down. For the town had to be put in a condition that would be pleasing to the prince, useful to them, and secure against invasion. Mansell had to be made strong within and without against its enemies. Emmanuel gave the orders and how they scurried about to do his bidding. New towers they put on workmen in shifts around the clock and built the towers strong and tall and mounted great slings on them, ordered from Shaddai's court. A new weapon. Its purpose was to throw stones from the castle out at Mouthgate. They installed it with joy, for it was a weapon to be reckoned with. It could not be resisted. Its power was beyond belief. It was called intercessor. It was committed to the care of the brave Captain Faith. The seal of Diabolus? Down, said Emmanuel, and they fell over each other to obey. In a frenzy of activity, they tore it down and beat it into pieces. What to do with the debris? Out, out! They threw it on a dung heap outside the city wall, 
glad to be rid of it. And in its place they put up the great seal of Jedi, along with the seal of Emmanuel, upon the castle gates. The three strongholds Diabolus had built, all three must go, said Emmanuel, and a thousand sprang into action as one man. They whacked away until the hold of defiance was in shambles, and the midnight hold was demolished, and the sweet sin hold was a heap of rubbish. They had a time of it, too, for these holds were large and sturdy, but they kept at the cumbersome job until at last, sweating and tugging, they carted the timber and the iron and the junk and the dirt that was left outside the town. While this was being done, Emmanuel called the three greatest defenders, the three former prisoners. Understanding, he said, I wish to restore you to your former office. Yes, Lord. And I wish you to build yourself a palace, but this time let it be a palace built like a tower for defense. You will build it near Eye Gate, and you will read in the Revelation of Mysteries all the days of your life that you might know how to perform the duties of your office. In conscience, yes, Lord. You will no longer be recorder for the town. I am making Mr. Knowledge the recorder in your stead. Yes, Lord. Not out of any contempt for you. Rather, I have something else planned for you. I shall tell you about it when the time comes. And will. Yes, Lord. I am giving you the care of the gates, the wall, and the towers of Mansell. I charge you to withstand all attacks made by the enemy and I will provide you the strength to do so. And I commission you to apprehend and bring to justice all diabolins still lurking here. Yes, Lord. Yours is a great responsibility. Yes, Lord, yes. But I believe I am equal to it, with your help, Lord. You will be glad to know that some of the worst diabolin offenders have already been put into custody and are to go on trial. Some of them are the ones will has already apprehended understanding and will be well and conscious looked at their lord they were aglow with this new intimacy it was hard to comprehend almost too wonderful to believe they had gone to emmanuel and fetters condemned to death first there was the pardon then the robes of praise and chains of gold and the triumphant march back in the town then the fellowship, the feast, the songs, the riddles and revelations, the treasures, the special secret gifts and dainties. Then the work of tearing down strongholds and old symbols and putting up new ones. And now this. What a long way they had come together. The trial is set for the very near future, said the prince. We'll be there, Lord, they said.